So that's it. What, we some kind of suicide squad? Oh, I get it. I, I, I see what you did there. Producer Dan Lin announced plans to make a Suicide Squad movie in 2009 with Stephen Gilchrist also producing and Justin Mark working on the script. The movie never got out of pre-production until the DC Extended Universe was announced to follow Man of Steel. The first two movies after Man of Steel would be Batman v Superman, Dawn of Hypocrisy, and Suicide Squad. David Ayer was hired to direct and write the film in September 2014. He had to get a script written in six weeks for the movie to stay on schedule. Casting began almost immediately with Ryan Gosling, Tom Tom Hardy, Will Smith, and Margot Robbie being offered the roles of The Joker, Rick Flagg, Deadshot, and Harley Quinn, respectively. The main cast was announced December of 2014 as Hardy, Smith, Robbie, Jared Leto, Jai Courtney, and Cara Delevingne. Tom Hardy then had to do reshoots for The Revenant and had to drop out. Thank you for your courage, honor, and service. Yeah. The role of Rick Flagg was offered to Jake Gyllenhaal, who turned it down. Joel Kinnaman would later take the role. The main cast was complete in January of 2016, including Ben Affleck as Batman, Ezra Miller as The Flash, and Viola Davis as Amanda Waller. Filming started in April of 2015, but after Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice was criticized for being too dark, a series of much-publicized reshoots took place throughout 2016 in an attempt to make this movie much more lighthearted and in line with the well-received trailers that were released for the movie. With a history as free of issues as this, there's no way this movie was anything but a flawless gem. <laughs> you serious? What? I got a contract. Kill Harley Quinn. Do it for your freedom and your kid. Oh, she did. I missed. Okay, I have a serious question. Why isn't Deadshot willing to kill Harley here? At what point did they become friends at all? Sure, they talked for a couple minutes. Is that all it takes for Deadshot to decide he likes someone and would rather not kill them? He must suck at this assassin thing. I won't do nothing to harm her. Oh, I'm surprised at you losing your head over a girl. She said we was bosom companions. What? Just listen to some of these lines of dialogue that were actually written for a character to say. They say you never missed a shot. Prove it. You notice these are criminals? Hmm? They're psychotic antisocial freaks. It makes no sense. Welcome to the party, Captain Boomerang. Here comes Slipknot, the man who can climb anything. Wonderful. Listen up! You're next. Injection you got. It's a nanite explosive. It's the size of a rice grain, but as powerful as a hand grenade. You disobey me, you die. You try to escape, you die. You otherwise irritate or vex me, and guess what? You die. This is Katana. She's got my back. She can cut all you in half with one sword stroke, just like mowing the lawn. I would advise not getting killed by her. Her sword traps the souls of its victims. Three days ago, a non-human entity appeared in the subway station. So Waller sent me and a woman with incredible abilities. A witch. See, nobody could get near this thing, but the witch could. Needless to say, the whole thing was a bad idea. She bolted! Shit. And that's how she escaped from Waller. So now you know. 
got mail. Hello, Austin. This is Basil Exposition. What? I honestly don't know what to say here. In a movie about villains, the one character they absolutely failed to do a good job on was the antagonist. That seems like a massive misstep. The whole movie is essentially like an Avengers for villains. You should have a damn good villain for them to go up against. As it is, I have no idea what Amanda Waller thinks. A super marksman, a guy with boomerangs, a girl with a baseball bat, and what does this guy do again? Here comes Slipknot, the man can climb anything. Wonderful. Whatever. What does she think these people can do against some sort of super magic being that is zombifying the local population while she shoots a beam into the sky in an attempt to destroy or conquer the world? So let me guess. We're going to the swirling ring of trash in the sky. You know, because why wouldn't we? She's so poorly developed, I have no idea what her endgame even is. Maybe her goal is to become the most awesome belly dancer ever. Makes about as much sense as any other part of her character. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. What? I appreciate all the money they threw out to get the licensing for all the music they used. Fact is, it wasn't necessary and frequently distracted from the movie. The only reason I can think of why they did this is because another movie about a lesser known comic book used licensed music through much of its runtime and was a big hit. Difference being, that movie did have a reason for the music woven into the plot. Here, it's just there for no reason. It's like the editor had a playlist playing and just decided to cut it into the movie. Also, I didn't know Captain Boomerang had a thing for unicorns until this movie. Then I look it up and realize he doesn't. But there is a character that does. I'm certain the success of that movie right before Suicide Squad's reshoot had no effect on them whatsoever. Whoops, <laughs> you weren't meant to see that. What? You don't know me. This is something I didn't notice when I first watched the movie, but one of my fans did. You know, they're not supposed to be romanticized. Like, the whole point is that, you know, the, jo the Joker, he, he abuses Harley. The whole relationship between Harley Quinn and Joker is completely wrong here. The problem isn't with Harley, she's devoted to him. The problem is the Joker. The Joker doesn't care the first thing about Harley. She's a tool at his disposal. The idea that he would actually dedicate resources to save Harley is in complete defiance of who the Joker is. Only bit that seemed to fit normal canon yet seems off in this movie is the Joker crashing the car and fleeing, leaving Harley to drown or get captured by Batman. Uh, does a wood sink in water? No, 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 it floats! It floats! Throw her into the pond! <laughs> what? Does someone want to explain why the Joker is playing any role in this movie? From the trailers, I assumed he'd be the main villain. Uh, uh, not good. Which would make sense, since the animated movie Batman Arkham Asylum, which is really a Suicide Squad movie with Batman in the title to sell copies, Joker was the main villain the Suicide Squad went up against. I get having him in Harley Quinn flashbacks because showing her origin without the Joker would be like showing Spider-Man's origin and not showing a spider. But they dedicate screen time to this side plot about him trying to save Harley, which actually seems out of character. He's not the type of guy to stick his neck out for people no matter what they mean to him because... Let's face it, no one means anything to the Joker except that they have some sort of twisted comedic value. So this side plot is out of character and it doesn't even contribute to the overall plot. It's just a distraction. As for Jared Leto's performance, I honestly didn't care. I didn't think it was terrible as much as it just felt like Heath Ledger's, but not as good, which might actually be worse than if he did his own thing and sucked. The Heath Ledger Joker was a unique creation of Ledger, Christopher Nolan, Jonathan Nolan, and David S. Goyer. Though looking at Goyer's resume, I have to question his contributions. It earned Ledger an Academy Award that was well earned. It's a role he'll never be able to reprise for obvious reasons, but trying to copy it is a terrible idea. After all, we have yet to see a live-action theatrical comic book accurate Joker. Closest we have to that is Mark Hamill, and he's not live-action. 
I'm impressed. That's where Leto could have made his mark, but instead he and the DCEU and WB missed their opportunity to do something that comic book fans would really appreciate and the general audience would get a chance to see. The Joker, as he's been for many decades in the comic book. But instead, we get a Joker that paints hot all over his room and arranges various items in a circular pattern. Just what the world wanted to see. The Joker with OCD. But why actually put effort in making a good Joker when you can just completely half-ass it? What's kind of amazing is how much I have to say about this issue and it isn't even number one. Just do a half-assed job. Flag, talk to me. What's going on down there? I have a sheep bolted. There's a moment this movie cuts out when the Enchantress makes her move to conquer the world, or destroy it, or whatever the hell she's doing. However, what was missing was fairly self-explanatory and really didn't need to be in the movie. Later, they actually show the audience what they missed, except it's exactly what they thought happened. There's no new information to gain from this reveal. It just shows us what we assumed was there. It's like having a scene in a movie where a person is eating breakfast, and the next scene is them at work, and later in the movie it's revealed that the character left the breakfast table and got not ready for work. That's not a reveal. That's just obvious. <sighs> what a twist! What? All right, men, this is a dangerous mission, and it's likely one of us will be killed. The landing party will consist of myself, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and Ensign Ricky. Ah, oh, crap. Slipknot actually has a pretty big role in the story. Suicide Squad was created with the idea that perhaps some of the characters might die. When the modern version was being created, the creator asked specifically for old characters that weren't being used anymore with the idea of killing off a couple. Problem is, they never treat Slipknot as a full-fledged member of the team. All the team gets flashbacks introducing them, even Katana who is shoved in very last minute. All Slipknot gets is a quick voiceover by Captain Exposition. Here comes Slipknot, the man who climb anything. Wonderful. At no point do we spend any time with him, and at no point are we even somewhat invested in his character. He literally just pops up and dies almost as quick. His death is supposed to establish that anyone on the team could die, but instead he just comes off as a red shirt going on an away mission with Kirk and Spock. Light! Growing! Dimmer! Can't! Breathe! Beam me up, God. Whew, I did not see that coming. What? Really? Really bad. If you told me every scene in this movie was handed to a different person and that each scene was put together without these people interacting, and you also told me the end product is nothing more than those scenes being slopped together, I would believe you, because that is exactly how this movie feels. It's like a collection of mini-movies that come together to make one whole movie. But none of the mini-movies is particularly good except for that bar scene. That bar scene is easily without doubt the best part of the movie. It actually gives me a reason to care about some of these characters, but it comes much, much too late. There's also a massive amount of redundancy going on in the film. They spend time introducing us to Deadshot, then they introduce us to Harley Quinn, then we get the title screen, then they introduce us to Deadshot again, then they introduce us to Harley Quinn again. Why would you do that? If you like both introductions, then figure out a way to weave them together. If you can't do that, then one must go. This movie is a mess. I literally cannot think of a better way to describe it. For everything this movie got right, it got at least one more thing wrong. Will Smith brings his usual charisma to Deadshot, Margot Robbie was spot on as Harley Quinn, Jay Hernandez brings a lot of humanity to El Diablo's rather generic backstory, Jai Courtney is criminally underused as Captain Boomerang, yes, I said Jai Courtney, who typically brings all the entertainment value of grass growing, is awesome here, and the movie could have used more of him. 
there are random moments of the movie that work quite well, and the bar scene is fantastic. Then you have the Joker, who doesn't feel quite right. He actually appears to care about Harley Quinn here, which is counter to most any version of the Joker in existence. Harley Quinn's addiction to the Joker is much more like a drug addiction than any sort of relationship. When the Joker offers Harley a crime boss, traditional Joker would find the idea of Harley sleeping with the crime boss trying to please him hilarious. But here, it seems as though the crime boss has no options. Joker seems to genuinely care about Harley Quinn in his own twisted way. <laughs> It seems fairly ironic that a movie about supervillains has one of the most generic villains to fight against in comic book movie history. Seriously, can anyone tell me why the Enchantress does what she does? Is she just pissed at Waller? If so, why not just kill Waller when she had the chance? Frankly, the movie seems scripted so that Amanda Waller is the main villain after all. She is responsible for this situation. She recruited these people, she set up the Enchantress to be her slave, everything just backfired on her. But they never explore that possibility. What's even more puzzling is that Batman assault on on Arkham is way better than this big budget live action Suicide Squad movie. If they just used the script from the animated film, the end result would have been far better. The movie actually has the Joker and Batman as the primary antagonist, which makes sense. The squad is sent to go after the Joker to get information from him. That's specifically why Harley Quinn is included in the squad, because Waller thinks Harley has a better chance of getting information from the Joker than most. Batman is after the information as well, but he's also after the Suicide Squad because they are villains and Batman doesn't typically mess around in gray areas. It also gave the entire squad equal treatment, which is why when they started dying it gave the sense that they might all die. In many ways, it's the movie 2016 Suicide Squad should have been. It's not perfect. But it's way better. But instead, Warner Brothers decided to sink a bunch of money and resources into this garbage fire of a product. And honestly, there's potentially an entertaining ad of this movie. I doubt it would be good, but perhaps something watchable. I would love to see that movie. Instead, we got a series of scenes edited together by what feels like different people, clumsily attached to each other, and commonly feeling like each scene has no relation to the next. This isn't as bad as Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, because this at least has some quality to the characters. But that doesn't make this movie good, just better. I give it a 4 out of 10 and consider it the second best in the DCEU so far, which isn't saying much. Hey, if you like this video, please make sure to hit that like button and go ahead and subscribe. That helps me out a lot. And if you really love this video, consider visiting my Patreon page.